Hello there, you perfectly lovely people. My name is Sarah, and I'm reading from 101 Dalmatians by Dodie Smith. This evening, I'm reading chapter 16, The White Cat's Revenge. The Staffordshire woke them up in good time. Every pup must be ready to leap out of the van the minute the tailboard was put down. Not that my dear pets would hurt you if they saw ya, said the Staffordshire, but it might cause delay. The van will stop in a big dark garage, shake it, turn stop, sharp left, and you will be in a dimly lit muse. And on your way, we'll say goodbye now. Can we send you news on the twilight barking? asked Pongo. Or will they ever get the chance to listen to it? said the Staffordshire. But I shall get news of you, all right. I'm a great one for the newspapers. They pass the time on the road. Always plenty of them in the van. We use them for packing. Well, here we are. The van stopped. The Staffordshire started to bark loudly. <laughs> Bit like my dog there. There we go. Um, Let him out, Jim, said Bill, before he breaks the sound barrier. Down came the tailboard. Out shot the Staffordshire. This time he managed to knock Jim right down before turning to Bill, whom he tackled low. Just about winded me, he has, said Bill proudly. Oh, you flying saucer, you. Jim got to his feet and spoke lovingly to the Staffordshire. If England had six of you, we wouldn't need no army, he said. Come home, get your supper, you misguided missile. <laughs> Bill and Jim had been much too occupied to notice the black dogs streaming out of the van and out of the dark garage into the mews. Snow had been falling for hours so that London was all white. The pups had scarcely noticed the snow when they were running away from Cruella's car. Now they at once fell in love with this beautiful feathery stuff. It raised their spirits wonderfully and they felt well rested after their sleep in the van. They were still hungry, but they didn't mind that much, because they were expecting a wonderful supper. Hearing them counting on this, poor Mrs. felt more anxious than ever. Bill, Jim and the Staffordshire had gone out to the garage by another way, so Pongo let the pups let the pups play in the snowy mews for a few minutes. Then Mrs. persuaded the cab pig to get back into her cart, and off they went. Because of the snow, there were very few people about which was just as well as the army of black dogs, was now very noticeable against the white streets. The only person who saw them was an elderly gentleman, on his way to a late party. He rubbed his eyes and shook his head and muttered, oh, And I haven't even begun Christmas yet. It only took a few minutes to reach the outer circle. How beautiful Regent's Park looked, snowy under the stars. Pongo said, Mrs, do you remember what I told you when we were saying goodbye to the park? Mrs answered, you told me to think of the day when we would come back with 15 puppies running behind us, and now we have 97. They'd not come back to the inner circle by the way they'd left it, but they were at the other side of the park, close to Cruella de Ville's house. As they drew near it, Pongo saw that every window was dark, so he thought it would be safe to call a moment's halt. Look, pups. He told them, that is our enemy's house. Lucky said, may we scratch it and bite it? It would only hurt your nails and your teeth, said Pongo, looking up at the huge house. Mrs was looking down the street. Something moved there. Something only a little less white than the snow. It was Cruella's Persian cat. Her back was arched and she was spitting angrily. Pongo said quickly, uh, Madam, none of us would ever dream of hurting you. The white cat said, That is the civilest speech I have ever had from a dog. Who are you? There are no black dogs around here. We're not usually black except for our spots, said Pongo. We once visited your house. He got no further because the white cat guessed everything. Well, and well she might, after all the talk she'd heard between Mr and Mrs Deville. And you rescued all the pups from Hell Hall. Well, Bravo! Bravo! I couldn't be more pleased. Then Mrs. remembered what Cruella de Vil had said on the night when the puppies were born, and she spoke to the white cat very kindly, saying, I might have known you would sympathise, for I once heard you lost many kittens in your early infancy. In early infancy. Forty-four to the present date, said the white cat, 
all drowned by the fiend that I live with. Why don't you leave her, said Bongo. I bide my time, said the white cat. I wait for my full revenge. I can't do much on my own. I've only two pairs of paws, but I scare the servants away. Any cat can make a house seem haunted. I let the place become overrun with mice, and oh, how I scratch the furniture. Though it's heartbreaking how little she notices it. She is such a rotten housewife. Why not let your pups come in and do some damage now? Oh, please, 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 please let us, clamoured all the pups. Pongo shook his head. Cruella will be back. I'm surprised she's not home already. Oh, she's been back, said the white cat, and gone out to dinner. She had to because I scared another batch of servants away this morning as a little Christmas present for her. Do come in. No, no, Pongo, cried Mrs. This is no moment for revenge. We should get the pups home. They are hungry. But the pups clambered louder and louder. Please, please, let us damage Cruella's house. They made so much noise that Mrs. could not hear what the cat was now saying to Bongo. At last he turned, quietened the pups and said, Mrs., I now feel that we should do as our friend suggests. It would take me a long time to explain why, so will you trust me, please? Of course, Pongo, said Mrs. loyally. And if you're really sure we ought to be revenged on Cruella, well, naturally, I shall enjoy it. Then follow me, said the white cat. There is a way in at the back. Lucky and two big, loud, barked pups were left on guard. They were sorry to miss the fun, but duty was duty. Three barks if you sight the striped horn or hear its striped car or hear its striped horn, Pongo told them. Then marched all the other pups after the white cat. The little blue cart was left in the mews at the back of the house. The cat pig insisted going into the house and getting her fair share of the revenge. The white cat took them in through the coal cellar. Nothing down here worth wrecking, she said, making for the stairs. Up through the dark house they went until she paused outside a bolted door. Now, if you really can undo that bolt, she said to Pongo, goodness knows I have tried often enough. Oh, he is splendid at bolts, said Mrs. Proudly. It was a nice chromium bolt, well oiled. It gave Pongo no trouble at all. There was light enough from the lamps on the outer circle to show them the big room in which there were many racks of fur coats. Why, Cruella must have dozens of them, thought Mrs. And there were many fur stoles, muffs, etc. too. Pongo barked his orders. Four pups to a coat! Two pups to a stall, one pup to a muff, present teeth, tear. There was no space in one room to finish the whole job, so the pups spread themselves through the house. After that, the fur flew with a vengeance in every, dis- every direction. Chinchilla, sable, mink, beaver, nutria, fox, and many humbler skins. From kitchen to attic, the house was filled with a fog of fur. And the white cat did not forget the ermine sheets. She did good work on those herself, moving so fast it was hard to see which was clawed white ermine and which was clawing white cat. I've been slack, she said. I could have got it those years ago. One needs company for a job like this, said Pongo. No more no more first to tear now, said the cat pig sadly. She just threaded a little sable tippet all by herself. Quiet! Barked Pongo suddenly, had his ears deceived him. Nope, there it was again, a distant blast from the loudest motor horn in England. The next instant, the pups outside barked their alarm. Down, down to the coal cellar, barked Pongo. There was a wild scurry of pups down in the dark stairs. The white cat sprung to the window. You'll have time, she cried. The car's only just turned into the outer circle. But Pongo knew how fast that car could come and pups were falling over each other in the darkness and there were bumps and yelps. Roly-poly fell through the banisters, which was amazing, he wasn't hurt. But at least, at last, they were all streaming out of the coal cellar into the mews. In your places for counting, barked Pongo. He'd long invented a quick way of counting the army. Pups for nine rows of ten and one row of seven, which included the cat pig in her cart. Swiftly, he counted now. And three and four. There are three pups missing! 
They must be somewhere in the house, cried Mrs. We must rescue them. Pongo dashed towards the coal cellar and then stopped, <sighs> gasping with relief. Lucky and the two loud bark pups were just coming from the front of the house. Pongo had forgotten them in the counting. The army was complete. Cruella's nearly here, said Lucky. We must make sure she's gone indoors before we march on, said Pongo, and he ran into the narrow passage that led to the outer circle. Mrs. ran after him. Be careful, Pongo, she'll see you. Not in this dark passage, said Pongo. The striped car went by the end of the passage. A light was on inside and they could sell, see Cruella grow clearly. Oh, Pongo, wailed Mrs. She's still got her absolutely simple white mink coat. Pongo ran on towards the outer circle and Mrs. ran after him. Cautiously, they peered out of the passage and saw the striped car stop in front of the Deville's house. Mr. Deville, who'd been driving, helped Cruella out and then went up the front door steps. He started to search for his latch key. Cruella stood waiting with a cloak hanging loosely around her shoulders. I shan't sleep if she keeps that cloak, said Mrs. And you need your sleep, Mrs., said Bongo. The same idea had come to both of them. The cloak hung so loosely, so temptingly, and the relief of getting the pups safely into the house had made them feel daring. Pongo was happy to see his dear wife looking as mischievous as a puppy. She'll never recognise us once we're black, he said. Let's risk it. Now, they dashed towards Cruella and seized the hem of the cloak. It slipped from her shoulders quite easily and fell on top of Pongo and Mrs. Blindly, they hurled themselves along the outer circle with the cloak spread out over them and looking as if it was running by itself. Cruella screamed, it's bewitched! Go, quick, go after it. <laughs> no, no fear, said Mr. Deville. Oh, I think an ancestor of yours is running away with it. You'd better come indoors. The next moment, he and Cruella started to cough violently. For as they opened the front door, they were met by a choking cloud of fur. Somehow, Pongo and Mrs. found their way to the passage, where they'd come from under the cloak and dragged it to the mews. Here the puppies fell on it. And that was the end of the absolutely simple white mink coat. Lights were now flashing on all over the Deville's house and Cruella could be heard, sh heard? heard shrieking with rage. This is where we ma march home. Quickly, said Pongo. Suddenly all her high spirits deserted Mrs. Home? But would they be allowed in their house? All her fears came back. There were lights in the drawing room window. Mr. and Mrs. Dearly have yet to go to bed, said Pongo. Lights were shining up from the kitchen. The nannies are still awake, said Mrs. She said it brightly, and no one could have guessed how frightened she was, though her heart was thumping so hard that she was afraid that Pongo would hear it. Why should the dearlies let a mob of strange black dogs into the house? And unless they did get in, how could they show the dearlies that they were not strange black dogs? Barking would not help. She and Pongo would need to get close to their pets, close enough to put their sooty heads against the dearlies' knee or their sooty paws around the dearlies' necks. Suppose they are all turned away, 99 hungry Dal Dalmatians, outcasts in the night. At that moment, snow began to fall again, very, very thickly. <gasps> well, would you turn away 97 Dalmatians? Anyway, wash your, wash your hands, whoa, clean your teeth, go to bed, give yourself a great big huge cuddle, because tomorrow I am reading chapter... <laughs>